Welcome back. Welcome back. In the past 13 years, scientists have discovered more than 300 exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. Last week, for the first time, astronomers captured the first pictures of four of these planets. None of them seem to be habitable like Earth, but they do raise the possibility that other, more hospitable planets may be out there. Joining me now to talk more about these discoveries and the future of planet Earth is Astronomer Royal, Lord Rees. Martin, welcome. Very, very good, good to, to be on the programme, David. Thank you very much indeed. Now, now, your picture of the future of this planet is pretty gloomy. It's only 50-50 that we'll last. Well, I think only 50-50 of avoiding some setback, because although our planet has been in existence for four and a half billion years and has that length of time to run, this is a very special century. It's the first one when a single species, namely humans, has the power to control the fate of the planet. Right. And what we do this century is going to determine whether the future of our planet is going to be benign or sterile. And, and therefore, if it's only 50-50 chance, this means that we are likely to be, have a half and half chance of making the wrong decisions. I think there's a 50% chance of something like a nuclear war or worse between now and the end of the century. And uh, obviously by forethought, and care, we can minimize this chance. But I think because of the great empowerment of everyone by technology and a more crowded planet where we are singly and collectively having more influence on the planet, then we are putting the planet under stress in ways that are unprecedented. And ways that we are putting them under the planet under stress that we needn't do are what? Are there a lot of them to do with global warming? Or? Well, I think the main point is that the human population is rising. Uh, it's six and a half billion now at least, and it'll be probably nine billion by mid-century. And of course, each person is uh, consuming more, um, and this puts more pressure on resources like food and also of course the uh, consumption of fossil fuels is affecting the climate in a way that's going to cause extra problems of migration etc so those collective effects on our planet are very serious but I worry about something else rather different which is that uh, technology is going to empower individuals much more for instance uh, biotech is going to allow individuals to design viruses and uh, um, you can imagine just one or two people being mischievous with the same mindset as those who now design computer viruses, but designing real viruses. And uh, the global village will have its village idiots, but maybe one is too many. And I think it's going to be very hard to uh, avoid having these sorts of problems. We're used to the idea of small terrorist groups uh, causing havoc, and in our ever more interconnected world, we're going to have to worry about even individuals causing these problems. And that, I think, is going to be a big uh, uh, problem for all governments and lead to a bigger tension between uh, privacy and security. So, so is that why exoplanets are important? I mean, because if things really go wrong, we could move? Well, I don't, <coughs> I don't think so. I think uh, we've got to stay where we are and sal salvage our own planet because. Uh, uh, very few other places in our solar system are as benign to live in as even the South Pole or the top of Everest. So I think uh, it's uh, kidding ourselves to think that we can escape Earth's problem by going elsewhere. But nonetheless, an astro as an astronomer, one of the most fascinating things has been what we have learned about the other planets of our solar system, and even more, as you said in your introduction, about uh, other stars and planets around them. In the last 15 years, the night sky has become much more interesting because uh, we know that the stars we look at are not just twinkling points of light. Most of them are suns with planets orbiting around them, and probably you, like our solar system. Right. And, do you, and do you suspect that in these, on these exoplanets there is <coughs> other forms of terrestrial or extraterrestrial life? Well, we can't be confident about that. One issue at the moment is that the only planets we've detected are big ones, rather like the giants of our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, we haven't detected a planet like the Earth around another star, simply because they're much smaller and harder to detect. I think 20 years from now we will, but we don't yet. But there's every reason to suspect that there would be orbiting many, many other stars in our galaxy, uh, some planets rather like the Earth. It would be amazing if there weren't. There's every reason to expect that, although we haven't yet detected them. But, of course, even if there are planets 
like the Earth, um, what we don't know is whether they'd have life on them. And the reason for that is that we don't really know how life began here on Earth. Uh, we understand that once life got started, then Darwinian evolution operating over three or four billion years led from primordial simple organisms to the amazing biosphere of which we are a part. But we don't know quite how it got started. We don't know whether it was a rare fluke. And therefore, we can't be sure that uh, another planet like the young Earth would evolve a biosphere like ours or not. And where does God figure in this future mm. that you're mapping out? I have scientific colleagues who have all kinds of religious beliefs and none. So I believe in the complete coexistence between uh, science and religion. I mean, I think uh, uh, everyone has to accept the evidence for evolution, uh, but uh, the wonder and mystery of the universe is something which uh, impresses all of us and we interpret it in different ways. So I believe in peaceful coexistence between science and religion, no cause for conflict. Thank you, Martin, very much and God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> If you think that pirates only exist in history books and Hollywood movies starring Keira Knightley, think again. This year alone, there have been at least 83 Somali pirates attacks and at least 13 vessels with more than 260 crew members are still being held. This week, of course, big news. The Sirius Star, a Saudi-owned supertanker carrying 2 million barrels of oil and 25 crew members was captured by the pirates. For the ship's return, the pirates are reportedly demanding $25 million. Joining me now to talk more about the piracy threat in Somalia, or indeed off the coast of Somalia, is Roger Middleton from the African program at Chatham House. Welcome, it's good to have you with Thank us. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, now, negotiations are going on at this moment, mm -hmm. are they? And they are asking for $25 million. Yeah, that's the, the best information we have at the moment. The pirates have made an initial demand of $25 million uh, US dollars, and there'll now be a negotiation period. And, and in the past, sometimes that's taken as little as a couple of weeks, um, but sometimes it's even three months and even longer than that. So it could be quite a long period before a pr final price is agreed on and payment is made and, and the crew is released. And the crews in the, in the cases that have happened so far have been reasonably well treated, haven't they? Uh, reasonably well treated. I mean, I don't want to give the impression that it's a pleasant experience. It's obviously very psychologically hard for the crew. And in some instances, we've heard stories of them being uh, pushed around and even some people have complained of being hit and so on. Uh, but generally, they've been fed uh, adequately and, and nobody's been shot or, or anything horrible like that. So it's relatively um, a not too terrible experience. And why can't the ships find a way of resisting these pirates? Why are the pirates so effective? Well, it's, it's really tough. I mean, on a commercial ship, you don't, you don't have uh, men on board with guns and, and you don't have defensive systems like you would have on a naval vessel. Um, and the pirates are, are very heavily armed. They have AK-47s. Quite a lot of them have RPG, you know, rocket-propelled grenade launchers. Some have even more powerful sort of surface-to-air uh, surface missiles. Um, so they're, they're very they're bristling uh, with weaponry and, and quite scary. So there's not an enormous amount uh, that a ship can do. Once a pirate is on board, uh, 25 unarmed men against one man with a gun, uh, it's not really a fair fight. Um, so the only things the ships can do is try to avoid the pirates in the first instance. But the pirates use very fast and maneuverable small speedboats. And if you're in something like the Sirius Star, which is you know, a thousand feet long, uh, you know, your turning circle is a couple of miles. So it's very hard to take evasive action. And if they come alongside a boat, mm. as you say, they're, they're well armed. But couldn't, couldn't the, uh, the people who own the ship ha have their own security men to shoot them or something? Well, I mean, they could, and, and some people have made that suggestion, including the U.S. Fifth Feet, Fleet. Um, but there's a real danger then, you see. If the pirates at the moment, they'll fire rounds off as they're coming towards the ship, um, but those rounds seem generally to be, you know, to scare the ship and try and convince them to stop rather than to kill anybody. And I think the real worry for shipping companies is if you start firing back at the pirates, they'll start shooting to kill. I mean, there was one instance not so long ago where a rocket-propelled grenade uh, landed on the back of a small fishing vessel. Unfortunately, it didn't go off. But you can imagine something of that kind of explosive power on board a small boat, like a fishing boat, it would have definitely led uh, to the loss of life. And I think there's a real fear that you could escalate this problem 
um, and we'd see semen being killed, which hasn't happened to date. And how, whatever the sum of money that's mm. settled on, say $10 million, mm. whatever, yeah. how will that be delivered and how will the pirates get away? Sure. Well, I mean, it's very interesting because clearly there's no bank system in Somalia, so you can't just make a deposit and, and, and leave it at that. Um, so in most cases, what happens is the money is delivered by hand. Uh, so a private security company will be contracted. They'll be given a million dollars, two million dollars, ten million dollars in cash and used hundred dollar bills, um, which they'll put in suitcases. Then they get in a, a tugboat uh, with sort of ex-army uh, guys, ex-SAS people. They'll go up the coast to the ship that's being held, make contact with the pirates. They hand over the money, literally, here you go, here's one million, two million, three million. Uh, the pirates then, uh, they take the money and the, the boat with the soldiers leaves. So now the pirates have several million dollars. Uh, they have the crew of the ship, the cargo of the ship, and the ship. So they have everything all together. And the pirates will then divvy the money up between themselves. Each pirate will take you know, a, a proportion of the money. Um, and the pirates will have the ship drop them off at different points along the coast. I mean, uh, because they're afraid, obviously, once they get back on land, people know that they have this huge amount of money and they're worried of being robbed themselves. I see, but or, or arrested. Or, or arrested, but probably less so of being arrested. I mean, the real reason why we have this problem of piracy in Somalia is because there's no government in Somalia to, to put it out. Um, if you have a police force that functions and is reliable, you can go to a pirate's homes and arrest them. Uh, Somalia doesn't have that. I mean, it's probably the most lawless country in the world, and that allows this problem to thrive. So the pirates aren't so worried about being arrested, uh, much more worried about being robbed. Fascinating. Yeah. What a fascinating time. Right, Thank you very much for bringing us up to date on all of that. So if you're planning to go on a cruise, steer clear of the Gulf of Aden. That's our advice, the advice of Frost Over the World. We'll be back in seven days' time with the President of Kosovo and much more besides. Till then, goodbye for now. <laughs>